Thank you for joining us today. My name's Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Well Community Church. Welcome to Home Church. You know, our mission here at the Well is to help people connect to God and each other in every neighborhood. And to that end, if uh, you're a, kind of a guest with us, or maybe you're new in the last few weeks, we would love to know that you visited us here. In fact, uh, we'd love to do more than that. We'd actually like to connect with you. We'd love to have a conversation. Uh, so if you could do us something that would help out with that, uh, if you'd go to the Connect tab at the top of the menu, it'll drop down our online welcome card. And if you fill that out, we'd uh, love to get a hold of you this week. And if you're not watching from our home church platform, but one of the other platforms, you just need to go to our website, thewellcommunity.org, and you'll find our online uh, welcome card there on the website. Uh, we have several ways for you to get connected, even during this time where it's difficult and sometimes you might feel isolated. Um, you can find that on our website if you go to the community life section. But I want to highlight one specific way, and this one's for, uh, for the women, women of all ages and stages. Our women's Bible study is going to kick off on September 14th, and they're going to be studying the book of 1 Peter together. Um, they've made sure to provide many options for how you can connect and study God's word. Uh, but most importantly, you'll get to do it in community with other people through relationships, which again is what we're all about here. And as we think about connecting uh, to God and each other in every neighborhood, we're going to connect to God right now. We're going to lift our voices to worship our King, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who has given his life that we might have life. And then we're going to hear from his word as Pastor Brad continues through the Gospel of Matthew. So would you just join me now for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that you are a God who in your great love and wisdom has created us in your image. And then in our brokenness and rebellion against you, you saw fit that the God, uh, God the Son would become incarnate and he would give his life going to the cross on our behalf to take our place for the punishment that we deserve for sin to take our place and to rise again and through his resurrection that we might be offered hope and forgiveness and redemption through his blood. And so now, Lord, we come and we lift our voices to worship you in Jesus' name, amen. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my faith
to where you are. Would you just continue singing with us as we behold him to be the Lord of our lives today? Come on. And see him there, the great I am, and the crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us. And oh God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you. And lift it up on Calvary's hill. We curse your name. And even still, you bore our shame. You paid the cost. And oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on his hands. In Jesus, you will reign forevermore. So And for every sin, our Savior died. And the Lord of life, He can't be contained. And cause our God has risen from the grave. Yes, our God is risen from the grave. Victory is yours. We celebrate that today. We celebrate that with our lives. And we celebrate that just uh, in acknowledgement of what you've done for us. We acknowledge 
your goodness and your faithfulness, uh, God, through your son, Jesus Christ, for us. And as we recognize that, the song reminds us that we rejected him. You still, with your great love, showed us your mercy and your grace. And so we are so grateful for that. And so today we are gathered just to remind ourselves of that truth, that you're a God that is faithful now and will continue to be faithful. In your name we pray, amen. Well, it is good to be with you here this week. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in Matthew 27. Uh, if you've been with us for any number of weeks, you know we are in a long haul uh, series through the Gospel of Matthew. We've tried to break it up into mini series, and so we're in the final of those mini series, really called The Last Days. And we're dealing with this final week of the life of Jesus. And so as you're turning to Matthew 27, we're really talking not simply about the final days of the life of Christ, but by the time we get to this context in chapter 27, really the final hours. Last week we covered uh, the first three of six trials that Jesus endured. Those three from last week were the religious trials. This week we're covering the three Roman trials. If you remember, if you were with us, the accusation that was really leveled against Jesus coming out of the religious trials was the accusation of blasphemy which according to a Jewish audience was worthy enough to sentence him to death with one small problem. And that is that the Jewish population at that time were occupied and overseen by a larger Roman government that blasphemy was not punishable by death. And so these first religious trials really were getting the Jewish accusation of blasphemy to stick. But what they had to do is morph those charges by the time they get to the three Roman trials, to be not simply blasphemy, but what they ended up charging Jesus with was insurrection, or maybe more clearly, treason. And so that's what we're going to get to see here. And the key figure, as we look at the Roman trials, is a guy whose name you may or may not be familiar with, a guy by the name of Pontius Pilate. Now, what we know of Pontius Pilate is he was a governor in Judea. He's mentioned all throughout history, not just in the gospel accounts, but even in many of the historical writings in the early first century. And when he's mentioned, it's never good. He's actually not a very good dude whatsoever. And uh, we'll get into his character here in just a moment. But if you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed, he's even mentioned in some of the earliest Christian writings, like the Apostles' Creed that says, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified under, you guessed it, Pontius Pilate. So this guy is associated with, very closely, the death of Jesus. He is the one, from a Roman authority standpoint, who signs the execution order and delivers Jesus over to be crucified. And so it is worth noting, by the way, that uh, there seems to be a difference between what the Bible shows us regarding Pontius Pilate and what history records of him. When you read through this account, even that we're going to cover this week, it almost seems that from a biblical perspective alone, this Pontius Pilate was kind of a soft-handed, vacillating, feckless, appeasing, weak leader. He's not sure what to do. What should he do with Jesus? He tries to sort of get out of it. Um, and, and we see that biblically, but that does not match at all the historical picture of who Pontius Pilate was, which means there's probably something going on behind the scenes, and that's what we'll get into here this, this week. So Pontius Pilate, we know historically, was a Roman governor. We well, didn't get that position as a 20-year-old kid coming out of high school who tried to pick up a day job, you actually got appointed to that role because you had a very seasoned, very successful, and very highly regarded military career. So this uh, Pontius Pilate was a very seasoned military man. He was known historically for being very de uh, decisive, very successful, very disciplined. He was also exceedingly cruel and borderline tyrannical. He was a vicious anti-Semite. He not only was not a fan of the Jewish people, he hated the Jewish people. And any chance he got to 
to squash Jewish revolts or to instigate them he was interested. So for example, at one point he took shields that bore the image of the emperor Caesar, uh, Caesar Tiberius at the time, put those all throughout Jerusalem. And even to that date, most Romans knew you, you can do a lot of things, but don't put a graven image in the holy city uh, because the Jewish people would not respond well. Sure enough, the Jewish people lost their minds. And so he literally had soldiers go out into the crowds with swords drawn and was going to kill everyone that uh, opposed just putting a shield with the, with the face of Caesar in the city. And those were the kind of things he constantly did. He was like that nagging bully kid down the street who was just picking a fight with the Jewish people. He was also, interestingly enough, at this time in history, under investigation by Rome for, yes, that, the sort of instigation, gratuitous really, instigation of violence uh, in the city, but also misuse of funds. So he was, uh, he was under the microscope just a little bit. And the last thing Pontius Pilate wanted was another Jewish uprising, because that was a thing. But every time you turned around, the Jewish people who were not a fan of Roman occupation were finding a way to cause a stir and try to win back their land. All that to be said, that's the backstory that puts Pilate in this interaction between a rock and a hard place. He hated the Jews, and so he took no joy in appeasing the Jewish mob whatsoever. And yet he's under scrutiny by Rome, and so he could not afford another stain on his record. And so now we get into the context of chapter 27. If you go up and look at verse 1, in the context now, with all of that backstory in mind, it's an early morning, Friday morning, and Pilate is awakened with a mob at his door. Here comes now the Jewish Sanhedrin with Jesus in tow. Verses 1 and 2 tells us, when the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him, verse 2, and they led him away to be delivered to, now you guessed it, the home here of Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now Mark's account, and again, we have a benefit of teaching through a gospel because each gospel account adds a little different flavor and it's worth sort of bringing them all together. Mark's account includes the idea that it wasn't just morning, but it was early morning. We're guessing about 7 a.m. The first of three Roman trials begins interrupting the breakfast potentially or seeing Pontius Pilate with bedhead, one of the two, uh, here on this Friday morning when Jesus would be crucified. John's account adds a little bit more information in verse 28 of John 18. It says this, uh, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas' home to the praetorium, and it was early, it says, and they themselves, the Jewish Sanhedrin, did not enter the praetorium so they would not defile themselves and therefore not be able to eat the Passover. Now, the praetorium was... Uh, connected to the Antonia Fortress on the northern side of the Temple Mount. It was a Roman uh, stronghold, if you will, where a garrison was stationed. And when the festivals came and people were influxed into the city and Pontius Pilate wanted to make sure that uh, there was peace in the city, he left his seacoast home at Caesarea Maritima, journeyed to Jerusalem, and would take up residence, most likely, here in the Praetorium. And with him, by the way, came not only his rule and reign, but the uh, incredible amount of soldiers that accompanied him. Think of it like a big show of force to put down any potential rebellion. And the Jews, ironically enough, the Jewish leaders do not want to step into the praetorium because they don't want to defile themselves before the Passover. And so you're going to see in verse 11 that Pilate actually goes out to them. Now, the irony of this uh, is uh, not missed on me and hopefully not on you either. Here's the Jewish leaders who don't want to step inside the courtyard of the praetorium, this Roman palace, if you will. They don't want to step in there because they don't want to be defiled for the Passover. Yet it's these same guys who just organized a false arrest, who just arrested an innocent man, falsely accused him of blasphemy, which is, by the way, punishable by death, put up false witnesses, and by the way, the punishment of a false witness is whatever punishment you wanted on the accused would come back to you if you were proved to be false. So these men are full on lying. They conduct not one, not two, but three illegal trials 
and they beat Jesus, an innocent man, for hours, and yet they don't want to step in the gates of the praetorium so that they won't defile themselves for the Passover. The stench of hypocrisy is all over this passage. And in John's account, it says then, therefore, be, to accommodate them, Pilate goes out to meet them. And he asks him a question in John's account. He just says, look, if this guy's guilty, then just punish him by your laws. Why'd you wake me up this morning? And these guys say to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. And in that moment, Pilate's like, oh, dang. Like this, this just got serious. This, this moved from irritation to I better, ha I better handle this well. This isn't just you woke me up or upset my breakfast. This is now you wanna kill this guy, which means the mob is potentially gonna get out of control. And so now back into the context of uh, Matthew in verse 11, it says there that uh, Pilate brings him in out of the entrance there away from the Jewish leaders and he stands before the governor and the governor questions him and says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds, it is indeed as you say. Now, it's interesting that Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Because that's not what he was accused of back in uh, chapter 26, verse 63. If you remember, the Jewish leaders asked him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Well, that's a religious issue. But remember, the charges have morphed. So Pilate's not concerned if he's the Christ. He wants to know, are you the king? Because if you're a king, you might be a threat to Pilate, but ultimately to Caesar and therefore Rome. Well, in John's account, it gives us a little bit more of this dialogue that Jesus has in this moment privately with Pilate. And Jesus says this in John 18, verses 36 and following. He says, my kingdom, Jesus speaking, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate says to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, will you say it correctly that I'm a king? For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of truth hears my voice. And Pilate responds to him with the classic statement, what is truth? Now, I don't, I don't know what this scene was like. I, I didn't hear, obviously, the tone of Pilate's voice, but I don't get the feeling this was a true question. Like Pilate goes, man, great, what is truth? Like, help me understand. No, this is a shot. What is truth? And he just kind of, and blows off the comment. And so when he had said this, he goes out again to the Jews. And he goes, look, I find no guilt in this man. There's no guilt in Jesus. And now back to verse 12 of Matthew 27. The crowds continuing their vehement accusation. And while being accused by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus did not answer and so Pilate says to him, do you not hear how many things they are testifying now against you? Verse 14, he did not answer with regard to even a single charge. So the governor's amazed. You can imagine as the governor, you probably see all kinds of court cases, all kinds of people pleading and begging for their life. Here's a presumably innocent Jewish teacher getting accused by Jewish teachers of uh, insurrection and treason, and Jesus doesn't say a word, knowing, by the way, that Pilate has the authority to hand him over to be killed. And in fact, they have an interesting interaction about authority, and Jesus just says, look, man, you don't have any authority except what's given to you by my Father. And so uh, in Luke's account in chapter 23, uh, Pilate's looking for a politically expedient way to get this away from him. He sees this as a lose-lose situation. He's either going to appease the people he hates and kill an innocent man or not do anything with Jesus and cause a riot and Rome's going to come after him. And he is trying to find a way out. Like a good politician, he finds a loophole. In Luke's account in chapter 23, verse 5, they kept insisting, the religious leaders, that Jesus stirred up the people and his teaching was all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. And when Pilate, it says, heard that uh, he asked them if he was a Galilean. And they said, yes. And so he learned that he actually was teaching in the Galilee and the guy responsible for Galilee was a guy by the name of Herod. And Herod happens to be in town. Perfect. I'll send this over to Herod. 
So Pilate kind of says, hey, look, he's a Galilean that's out of my jurisdiction, so take him over to Herod and let Herod handle it. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think Pilate had any desire to abdicate authority to anyone except if it was politically expedient for himself. That's exactly what this was. So the second Roman trial begins at approximately eight in the morning in front of Herod. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke 23. We'll spend just a little bit of time there and then we'll get back to Matthew. In Luke 23, we get the backstory that Matthew doesn't include regarding the second Roman trial. Now he goes to stand before Herod Antipas. Now Herod is of the dynasty of the family of Herod's It was this Herod's dad, whose name, yes, unfortunately, was also Herod, uh, who was responsible for the killing, the infanticide of all of the infants at the birth narrative of Jesus. It was this Herod, Antipas, whom Jesus is now standing before, who uh, just several chapters earlier had John the Baptist murdered. Simply put, uh, this man, Herod, was no friend of Jesus. And in Luke 23, starting in verse 7, It says that when he had learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at that time. And now Herod was very glad to see Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time. So far, maybe so good. Because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. So Herod's not interested in Jesus in terms of the truth of what he's saying. He wants a magic trick. He wants a show. This is the same guy, by the way, who threw on a drunken party to the point that everybody in the party was so drunk that when his daughter-in-law danced before him and pleased him, whatever that meant, he said, I'll give you whatever you want. And she asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so he did it. Like, that's who this guy is. He has no desire to hear about righteousness and holiness. In fact, the reason that uh, there was such an issue with John the Baptist as John the Baptist called him out for marrying his brother's wife. And so Jesus is not in friendly territory here whatsoever. And in verse nine, he questioned him to, at some length. Jesus answered him nothing, didn't say anything. And so the chief priests and the scribes who were standing there in verse 10 continually accused him And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe, a kingly robe, and sent him back to Pilate. So Pilate's thinking, man, I got this. I'll send him over to Herod. And Herod's kind of a little bit strange in the head. Who knows what Herod's going to do? Herod might have him killed right there, which would be great. Everybody wins. I don't have to do it. The Jews get what they want. Herod can be Herod. No harm, no foul. Can I get back to my breakfast? And he thinks he's got it down until Matthew 27, flip back there, verse 19. The third Roman trial back at about 9 a.m. before Pontius Pilate, after Jesus is mocked by Herod, he's sent back to Pilate. And uh, Pilate, thinking that he had washed his hands of this thing, um, is going to get interrupted. Now, in verse 19, it's worth noting that while Jesus is, looks like, with Herod, His wife comes to him, Pilate's wife comes to him. And in verse 19, while he's sitting at this judgment seat, the throne from which they would uh, give verdicts, his wife comes and sends a message to him and says, look, have nothing to do with this righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Now that is really interesting. So here's this wife of the governor whom God somehow puts on her heart like, what he's about to do. She's wrecked by it and is trying to get him to find some way out of this thing. And so sure enough, verse 15, here the crowd comes back. And so Pilate thinks maybe he's got one more more opportunity. He's gonna give them an offer that certainly they would not be able to refuse starting in verse 15. It says, now at the feast, which is of course the Passover, The governor was accustomed to release for the people one prisoner whom they wanted. And at at that time, rather, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Now, apparently, historically, the Jews could come and ask for someone to be released. And what Pilate's going to do here is spin that a little bit. And instead of waiting for them to ask, he's going to go ahead and make the offer. And they have a guy by the name of Barabbas who was locked up, bottom of verse 16. Now, what do we know about Barabbas? Well, he's mentioned in all four Gospels. 
If you do a four gospel mashup, he's called a notorious prisoner, a rebel, an insurrectionist, and a murderer. Uh, Think of him like an ancient day terrorist. He may have been connected, by the way, to a group of zealots called the Sakari. And these were a group of people who carried daggers in their sleeves. They would walk down the marketplace, shank a guy, you know, at the local store and walk away while the guy died and bled out. That looks like maybe what this guy Barabbas actually was. Regardless whether he was associated with them or not, he was an absolute thug. And his primary target would have been Jews who were in league with Rome because these zealots who were, again, ancient day terrorists, didn't like the idea of Jewish people affiliating so closely with Romans, which meant that the Jewish religious leaders who stood a lot to lose by uh, Jesus and him threatening their political position, if this man Barabbas got out, they would have actually been physical threat. So in Pilate's mind, he's like, I got the perfect solution. I got the one guy who knows where they live and isn't afraid to sneak in at night with a dagger and I've got Jesus. And so he just says, which one do you want? Verse 17, as they gather together, he says, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus? There's your two choices. The terrorist thug or the religious teacher from the Galilee. This guy might kill you. This guy won't. Which one do you want? It's a pretty ingenious political play, actually. Um, And it seems like it would be an easy choice. But in verse 18... Pilate did this because he knew in verse 18 that there was envy that had caused them to hand over Jesus. So he, he knows, he sees through the ruse of the religious leaders. But in verse 20, the plan backfires because the chief priests and the elders do the unthinkable. They persuade the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. We want the thug terrorist hitman released and you can kill this guy. And uh, Pilate, is, he doesn't know what to do with that because they, they persuaded the crowd. So Pilate goes to them and asks them again in verse 21. He says to them, which of these two men, to the crowd now, which of these two men do you want for me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate, so they're, they're yelling his name, which is important here in just a moment. They're yelling his name, Barabbas, and Pilate says to them, what shall I do then with this one who you call the Christ? And they cry out, crucify him. And he says, why? What evil has he done? And they kept, kept shouting all the more, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so the, the crowd is just chanting, crucify him. Now, why, why is that significant? Well, Chuck Swindoll years ago wrote a book called The Darkness and the Dawn, phenomenal book, capturing some of the backstory here. And he's got a section in his book and it made me think differently about this passage because nobody thinks about what Barabbas was going through in this moment. So Barabbas, most likely, if they were able to get him so quickly, was actually locked up in the Antonia Fortress, which means Barabbas most likely was on death row awaiting his execution. And if you remember, Jesus is going to be executed and there's three crosses, one of them Jesus takes, which makes you wonder, is that third cross originally set up for Barabbas? And is he awaiting his crucifixion, knowing the time has come? And what does he hear? He's within earshot of the mob. And what does he hear? They're chanting his name, Barabbas, Barabbas. And then what's the very next thing he hears yelled even louder than his name? Crucify him, crucify him. And the next sound he hears is the rattling of the keys of the guards as they come to his cell. And Barabbas is thinking, this is it. I'm gonna go die. And they take him, they get him from his cell and they bring him before Pilate. And Pilate doesn't sentence him to death. Pilate sets him free. And in this moment, Barabbas is like, wait, what? I'm sorry, I would, are you kidding me? And he experiences the first of many who will experience the grace of God when he realizes that this Jesus died in his place, literally died in his place, that the cross that was set up for Barabbas ended up bearing the body of Jesus. Just an incredible picture. And then comes verse 24. Pilate sees that he's accomplishing nothing here. 
but that the riot is starting. And so he takes water, he washes his hands and he goes, look, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to this yourself. And the people shout in verse 25, his blood, Jesus's blood shall be on us and on our children. Wow. Now, some historically have used that verse to promote anti-Semitism. I, I, I don't think that's what uh, is intended in this passage by any means, because God is not done with his chosen people. The Jewish people are still God's chosen people. God will deal with them yet again. But when you look at the movement of the gospel going from the Jew to the Gentile and the mighty deeds of God in just a few short number of weeks are gonna be spoken in foreign tongues and the gospel is gonna go all over the world as of Acts chapter two, I think that's a fulfillment of verse 25. His blood be on us and and on our children. God's like, I'm going to the Gentiles. Also, just a couple decades from this, uh, the Jewish people will pick a fight with the Romans one last time. And the Romans will come in in 70 AD and destroy the temple and uh, lay Jerusalem in ruins. Again, another fulfillment of verse 25. And so in verse 26, they release Barabbas. Uh, He releases Barabbas rather for them. And then after uh, having Jesus scourged, he, and I just wanna pause there for a moment. Sometimes the Bible says something and you're like, wait, what's that? Like after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Well, both of those things, you're like, what does that mean? Well, to be scourged, honestly, was a several hour process. The Romans were masters of it. Uh, It was their ability to torture someone to the point of death. They called it the half death because the person being afflicted by the punishment wished that they would die. But the Romans were so good at this, they'd bring you right to the point of death and then bring you back. And then right to the point of death and then bring you back to the point where you were begging for them to just finish the job. Uh, They used what was called a cat of nine tails, a leather strap with pieces of glass or pottery or bone or metal in the straps, and it would literally rip the skin off of the person that they were beating with it. It was, in short, an awful process. And so they scourged Jesus, and they handed him over to be crucified. And we'll talk more about crucifixion next week. So the innocent savior of the world falsely accused, sentenced to death, at this point has experienced in a matter of hours, six trials. Three of them religious, three of them Roman. Now he's been scourged and he's stumbling at this point down the Via Della Rosa or the way of suffering heading to the cross to be crucified. We know Jesus ends up at the cross at noon. He goes on to the cross at noon. So this somewhere around a two hour process of the scourging, and the way of sorrows to prepare him for the cross. Now, it's easy to think when you look at the, the death of Jesus that Jesus was uh, a martyr. He's just a religious guy who died for his faith. But I think that's minimizing the issue and missing the point completely. Jesus was not a martyr, just someone who was killed. He was more than a martyr. He is the savior of the world. See, what Jesus did is he died to pay a price for our sins. If you remember, he drank the cup of the wrath of God to the dregs for you and for I. A cup that he had no business handling. It was ours, deservedly so, to drink. And instead, he drank it on our behalf. All of it, by the way, according to the plan of God. Don't miss God's sovereignty and providence in all of this. Jesus was not ambushed. He was not set up. He was outmaneuvered, not outmaneuvered, not outmanned. In fact, in Acts 2, listen to the way Peter says it in Peter's first message, Acts 2.22. It says, men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, the Nazarene, He was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And in so doing, you nailed him to the cross. By the hands of godless men, you put him to death. Did you hear that? The predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. No, this this was not just someone who died for their faith. He, He was not a martyr. And in fact, tucked throughout your Old Testament are these little clues that if you, if you read them, understanding what we just read here right now, as you read them, you go, of course, I didn't even see that. Listen to these clues. I'll just read a couple little passages out of Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 50, verse six. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Isaiah 52, 14. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. See, the Bible seems to communicate that through his suffering and through his death, he accomplished something much more profound than simply dying. Isaiah 53 unpacks it well. Listen to this, verses four and following. Isaiah says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to be placed upon him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. The Lord, hear this, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering for us. Are you kidding me? This Jesus and what he endured, he he was not a martyr. He, He was not just one who died for his faith. He was one who did something much more significant. He is the very savior of the world. Do you see that? Tucked throughout all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the hero of the text, Jesus the Christ, who came to to pay the penalty for sin that we should have paid. What a savior. And do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father earnestly. He said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. He says, but not my will, but yours be done. And in all of this trial, these trials and the scourging and the crucifixion, he had an opportunity to try another way. He had an opportunity if he wanted to to find a way off the cross. But no, no, after that time in the garden, his face was set on the cross. His identity and his purpose affirmed, and he walked through the way of sorrows to the cross for us. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. What a savior. Are you kidding me? We don't have a category for this kind of love. So what's the takeaway for a message like this? Well, I I would say if I had to grope for one and I find myself wanting words to adequately exalt this Jesus, but if I had to find one, I would simply say uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verses one through three said it better than I ever could, so I'll just read it. Therefore, Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross, despised its shame, and is seated now at the right hand of the throne of God, that we might consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Oh, what a savior. The psalm, the great hymn rather, actually says this. It's from the hymn, Just As I Am. It says, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. There are passages that challenge us intellectually and then there are passages where we just behold the beauties of our Christ and we just need to stop and say thank you. 
And I think this is one of those moments. Can we consider him who endured the cross, despised its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God? Can we consider him who endured such hostility at the hands of sinful men that we might not grow weary and we might not lose heart? Oh, what a savior, this Jesus our Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are humbled by the finished work of Jesus, by his death and the pain that he endured through scourging, bringing him to that point of the cross. We are thankful that he was willing to drink the cup for in his drinking it bypasses us that he drinks instead of us because we like sheep have gone astray, each of us in our own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Oh, what a savior. Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful savior, Jesus our Christ, whom we look to, find glory in, peace in, and we'll thank you for who he is in Jesus' name, amen. Well, so as we continue singing today, we respond to a message that we heard. We're encouraged by the reality that the, the insurance we have in Jesus and what he's done, that he wore the pain, he, he carried it all for us, and so we're gonna seek in light of that, of who he is, that blessed assurance, and Jesus is mine, and oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood and perfect submission all is at rest and I and my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting and looking above and filled with His good This is my story, this is my song, I'm praising my Savior all the day long, and this is my story, this is my song.
my Savior all the day long. Oh, yes, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Friends, in light of what we're just saying, would you celebrate with us the truth that we find today that He is risen and He is worthy to be praised? Come on! good to sing and to hear about the greatness of our God. You know, one of the great things I heard about our God today was that Jesus was not just a martyr. He was the very Savior 
of the world. And you know, if we look at ourselves in this story, we're, we're like Barabbas, right? Jesus has died in our place. And as we heard today, there is really no way to categorize the depth of the love of God that he has for you and that he has for me. The question is, will you embrace the love of God, the justice of God satisfied through Christ by dying in our place, the love of God put on display through that very same death? He's reaching out to you and me today. And so believers, like we heard the exhortation today, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so that we can run the race he's called us to for his glory. So good to be here today. Thank you for joining us. Just wanna let you know that next week, we're gonna take communion together and we're gonna really worship the Lord as we focus on what he did for us through that act of worshiping him in communion. So uh, get your uh, bread ready, get your fruit of the vine, your choice of the fruit of the vine and uh, prepare to join us for communion next week. And let's go now and uh, continue with what we have heard and what we have sung today and have a great week of worship.